Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're talking about Skinnamarink. Oh, God, we got to talk about this movie. <laughs> yes, oh, my God. I feel like this is all anybody on Twitter has been talking about. And I know there's other corners of the internet, but like, man, the algorithm has figured out that I've seen Skinnamarink and I can't get away from the memes <laughs> and the discourse. It's a very, it's a very divisive horror movie. I don't think people listening may know. Yeah, it's uh, it's something else. Definitely surprised me. Um, you know, was really creeped out by the trailer, and I'm surprised it's taken off the way it has, considering it's, it's it's a very like low budget, small thing. Me too. We're also talking about the Golden Globes. Uh, the Oscar picks are officially coming out next week. We've seen a lot of those movies this year. Uh, red letter year for off script uh, at the cinema last year. So I, I feel pretty good about saying we've got hot takes. But the Golden Globes are out. Uh, the winners are out at least. We're going to take a look at some of those and see what might transfer over and what may just not happen. Uh, we're going to look at Tar. Uh, <laughs> this movie came out last year starring Kate Blanchett as an incredibly talented, famous composer or conductor. I'm sorry. Uh, we watched it, and we're going to let you know what we thought. I'm glad we finally got around to this one. Uh, we missed it last year, but not not anymore. Got in our sights. Uh, and first of all, we need to get to the news. Our first story this week, HBO Max is hiking their prices for the first time ever, effective immediately. In fact, uh, already, this, this happened on the 12th, so we're five days past it. Uh, HBO bumped their prices on their subscription. They didn't even tell people, Andy. This wasn't an announcement. <laughs> they just did it. It That's was right. wild. Uh, That's how much right. did it go up? It's going to be going up an entire dollar, <laughs> and this is just for the ad-free version. It's going up from fourteen ninety nine to fifteen ninety nine uh, on the billing that starts next month. So it's not quite right away. It was just announced, um, but this goes in line with uh, HBO or Warner Media trying to make the streaming just more profitable. They're raising the price. They're also they've cut already cut a ton of content from their library, which is mostly cut to to not have to pay residuals royalties to actors producers all that and uh, they're looking to license those out to other ad supported outlets maybe something like paramount plus or something like that to be who knows uh we found the store in variety who has like this wild chart of <laughs> streaming services and monthly rates across january whether or not it's ad supported or not in fact if you're watching us on facebook or youtube where we live stream the show you could see this uh i i guess listen obviously i don't like it when any of these places hike prices it's a bummer when amazon prime goes up it's a bummer when netflix goes up but hbo might have figured out like the softest way to do it very small increments and with no runtime to think about it they just they just came out hey we're upping it a dollar sorry like it's the first time we've done it it's fine like typically netflix will announce yeah in in three months we're gonna up prices come june we're gonna go up three dollars january 2023 you better expect the hike and like i think that i don't know that gives me more time to dwell on it and get mad but if you kind of just say hey it's a dollar here it is i, I think it's gonna fly under a lot of people's radar yeah i also they have not raised prices in since the, the service launched in 2020 so it's almost a whole full three years with the price being the same that's kind of unheard of and so it's not unexpected and it's it's just a, a dollar amount it's most people aren't going to cancel uh over that um it's also important to know that the whatever big streaming service they're coming up with that's going to be a combination of hbo and discovery Whatever that whole thing is, it's supposed to be coming out this spring, which will be called Max. For that's what, what we know for now. Um, so that's on the horizon as well. Speaking of things on the horizon, uh, a movie that was out in theaters that you might have missed. We actually covered it here on the show. You can go back and listen to the episode. Uh, Decision to Leave is coming back to theaters uh, with an exclusive conversation between Park Chan Wook and Bong Joon Ho. Uh, Andy found this story. Uh, it's a bit of a slow news week, which is why it's worth covering, but it's kind of a special movie if if you missed it. I think it might be worth catching it. When's it going to be out, Andy? Uh, February 13th, just in time for Valentine's Day. It is a mystery <laughs> mystery romance. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, oh, my, yeah. it's a bit tragic. <laughs> Maybe don't take your significant other. Uh, yeah. But it was a really fabulous movie. We haven't seen a, a movie from Park Chan-wook in about five years. His last entry was uh, The Handmaiden, which is a Korean-era uh, period piece adapted from a British novel. Uh, so we hadn't seen anything for a long time. Really 
mature movie you it's nice to see a director it just constantly improve and it's gonna be back in theaters and it will also be accompanied by a conversation between uh famed korean director bong joon ho and park chan wook himself um we don't have the oscar noms again those are coming next tuesday but for now uh decision to leave is shortlisted for best international feature like it's it's considered that this might be you know one of the biggest films of the year uh from cinemas that aren't in the united states so it's worth mentioning that it's pretty good we already covered it on the show i can't recall which episode you can just scroll down a ways on episodes and you'll see not too long ago just a couple of months ago, yeah, it wasn't that yeah. long ago we went and saw it. And if you want to catch that conversation between Bong Joon Ho and Park Chan Wook, it's actually already online, which is crazy. Uh, YouTube's got it on Mubi's official channel, so you can go check it out there. It's a four and a half minute conversation. I'm gonna go watch that after the show. One more thing before we get to Skin of a Rink, uh, Avatar Two crosses 1.9 billion dollars globally. <laughs> He's done it. My God, he's stopped. done it again. God, James Cameron cannot be defeated. Uh, after a whole lot of bluster leading up to the release of Avatar 2, it turns out not only has it made its money back in droves, but it is well on its way to James Cameron's big fat goals of making this one of another biggest films ever. Uh, I think it's just about to beat, or it just beat Spider-Man No Way Home uh it was part of homecoming that's the one the last spider-man movie uh in the box office i don't know what it's about to topple next but i think the two billion dollar mark yeah i mean it's in its sights right i think it's probably going to cross over any <laughs> probably this this week i think yeah it's will be, only be the sixth film to have crossed the two billion dollar mark uh, which is crazy. And again, I mean, I was totally wrong. I, I thought this would putter out at like a billion, billion and a half at, at, at most. And it's well on its way past that. Could hit, you know, two and a half. Could it I three? Who knows? Um, it would be the first movie to do that if it did. But huge, huge weekend for Avatar 2. It continues to just stay in theaters and people continue to go, which is just mind blowing because it's, it's hard to do that in, in this climate and no film that isn't like a sequel or, a, or I guess it is a sequel, but it's not a really familiar franchise property has really been a, able to do that. So that's really pretty incredible. In the number two slot, we had Megan doing uh, another 20, 20 or so odd million has made 60 million domestic, even more globally on a $12 million budget. So another, Big win for small horror. I know the folks over at Blumhouse and Atomic Monster are really happy about that, and they they're already talking sequels. It's it's going to be going in. And we have, we had a couple of new entries. We had a, a man called Otto, which is the two Tom Hanks family dramedy, take your parents to see, see movie, uh, and also Plane uh, to round out the, t the top five with uh, Gerard Butler in a kind of B action movie. Uh, last last week, I made a claim about a man called Otto, and I wasn't sure. Uh, I asked whether or not that he, Tom Hanks' character is actively trying to commit suicide in that movie, because I'd read that somewhere, and Andy wasn't sure, so I went back and looked it up. It is. That's exactly what's going on in that movie. <laughs> so, a bit of a content warning. I can't believe they don't advertise that. I mean, I guess you're not going to advertise that somebody's trying to, you know, arm, arm themselves, but like, oh my god. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe... I can't believe that's what's happening in there. It's like uh, Elizabeth Town with Orlando Bloom. Like there's a scene <laughs> where he's like just uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I I think of everything I've seen at the box office this week, uh, I'm most surprised by two things. Number one, it's gonna rank, but we'll get to that shortly. Number two, uh, man, people really like that new Puss in Boots movie. Like the the critic score is like twenty percent higher <laughs> than the score critic score for Avatar. Like it just seems like across the board, everybody seems to think that movie's pretty good. Uh, and if we're not careful, I think we're gonna be looking at another Shrek movie probably pretty soon right like that's there's got to be something like that in the pipe because that's where it comes from it's, it's, it's shrek reborn shrek ip yeah that's right shrek six coming to a shrek, theater new year. shrek origins <laughs> yeah Sh shrek gun maverick um a shrek story yeah a shrek story indeed but otherwise uh not a very surprising week at the movies i, I think i like real quick I I love the variety of things that are in theaters right now. Like cin <laughs> cinema is coming back in a big way, baby. We got big CGI Avatar. We got exciting animated children film for kids. It's actually doing like really cool animation, Puss in Boots. We got weird horror Skinnamarink going around. Uh, Megan is doing this like camp horror thing. Some good variety out there. 
All right. Just 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 across the board. It's not a bad time at the movies right now. Might be worth get, taking a date out or, you know, going to see something because, man, there's a lot of weird stuff out. And I, it's not a bad January, I don't think. Right, Andy? No, it, it's like I said, January is usually a kind of a bad month for films and we've actually had some pretty decent releases this month. Yeah, we sure have. And with that, we should probably get to one of the most exciting things I think we might have ever watched for this show. Uh, listen, <laughs> if you don't know a lot about Skin and Rink, um, I'm not sure where exactly to start in on it, but I think we should just kind of go for it. Uh, the movie is Skin and Rink. So Skin and Rink is a a different kind of horror picture uh i explained a little bit at the end of last week's show uh skin and is a micro budget horror a la the blair witch project or paranormal activity right it's an indie horror film made with very very little money fifteen thousand dollars to be exact uh by a youtuber uh who started a channel a while back where he would uh film like creatively low incredibly low budget lo-fi uh ideas that you users would submit for their nightmares things that people saw in their dreams sleep paralysis uh kyle edward ball would film this and create uh, little shorts out of it and one nightmare that he kept seeing over and over and over again was i'm like six years old i'm in my house i'm watching cartoons at night none of the lights work and there's no doors and windows and mom and dad aren't there and i can't get out and there's something in the house with me there's, there's something in the dark like that i just it's like haunting me I can't get away from it. Uh, and he took that idea and he developed this into a hundred minute feature called Skinamarink. Skinamarink plays at the <laughs> digital uh, portion of, I think South by Southwest uh, film festival and causes quite a stir, but because it's the digital portion and not actually physical, uh, somebody rips it off and puts it online and creates a, a a bit of a pirate loop for skin of a rink where people start talking about it and then they post a link to it and somebody else says oh i've got a link for it right here and it passes on reddit and starts moving through tumblr and somebody sets up a google drive for it before you know it, skin of a rink is getting passed all over the place skin of a rink drives up so much buzz for its unnatural trappings and its crazy horror uh that <laughs> it ends up getting picked up by shutter the horror company, uh, the horror streaming service, who runs it into a cinematic release. This $15,000 movie plays in 600 theaters uh, in the United States, the same number of theaters that Netflix put Glass Onion in for a week. Uh, and so far it has made $700,000. Uh, a horror film that would not have been what it is without the piracy of people stealing it <laughs> and, and would not have the buzz that it has without what's happening in it so with all that and that's way too much intro let's talk about skin and skin and is a horror film about two young boys or a young boy and young girl in 1995 whose father goes missing and while in their house at the dead of night all of the doors and windows begin to disappear and slowly they begin to find that there is something lurking in the darkness with them uh, that they can't get away from uh, some kind of unseen evil some kind of unseen horror uh, it is a incredibly low budget horror film uh, that takes really creative strides to be scary and different by just kind of using very still shots very thick film grain very clever sound design uh, and a whole lot of ambience and tone to develop a feeling of like being trapped in the darkness uh, in, in your theater. Um, people have said you should watch it best at home alone. People have said maybe it plays best in a the theater. I'm excited to talk about it. Andy, what, what do you think of Skinamarink? Man, this is one of the scariest movies I've seen in a long time. It's, it's probably <laughs> scared me more. Like I, the last thing that really scared me w was Hereditary back in uh, 2018. And I, it's funny because I was recently thinking, I was like, nothing's really scared me like that movie. Like there's creepy stuff here and there or a good jump scare here and there. But nothing has really gotten under my skin like this movie did. It is painfully slow, but it, it feeds on that fear, uh, the fear of the unknown, kind of just like being scared of the dark. And if like if you've ever been home late at night, all the lights are off and like. You think maybe you see something out of the corner of your eye or, you know, you, you think that like that coat and hat on the rack, it looks like a person. And this preys on, on that fear because so many of the shots are, are like looking down an empty hallway or like you just see 
the frame is just part of it is lit and there's lots of looking into dark voids and it's like your eyes are kind of playing tricks on you and you're like is something there is something not or is something moving and it just it really gets in in your head that way and there's danger and not danger at the same time like you know that this these kids are trapped with some sort of entity in this house but also it's they're not just like being attacked outright either yeah i i agree with andy i think skin and Rink might be one of the scariest movies i've seen in a really long time uh and that that sca that that scariness that that haunting nature of it comes from its like uncanny ability to prey on this like kind of kind of really deep set in fear we all have of being like a kid and being scared of the dark um in your house right like not 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 like the dark in the woods just like just trying to go to sleep and being afraid of what's in the hallway or the door that creaks open at night and you don't know where it comes from like the things that go bump in the night are the things that skin and Brink preys on and much like blair witch project and paranormal activity um you're not going to get any like <laughs> i don't I don't want to be spoilery here, but you're not getting like wall to wall, insane CGI action scares or anything far from it. Just like those movies, like skin and rink is effective in its minimalism. It's what you don't see. That's scary. Like it's the things that, that aren't jumping out at you, that your brain is creating in the darkness that starts to freak you out. And part of the reason that's so effective is because of its uh, very explicit dedication to showing basically as little as possible inside of this house uh, the film is very dark uh not only in like its brightness uh but in its color uh, it's practically black and white like it's very very uh, desaturated very toned back and covered in film grain that we'll talk about in just a moment uh and often the camera is not moving in fact the, the dedication to not having any kind of moving camera is very explicit the camera is usually very solid it's just set on a tripod and it'll be set low in the house low in a hallway low in a room and looking up usually like like a kid would be right like looking up at a hallway looking up at the ceiling up the stairs uh up at a light switch that you're going to try to flip on and often uh the, there's no movement nothing will happen there, there are the whole sw swaths of this movie where it's more akin to a slideshow than it is to a movie like really the, the soundtrack is pretty persistent you'll usually get some sweeping of music or or, or the television or maybe some dialogue um, but that all comes like uh, the visuals at the expense of a very thick soundtrack full of film grain like that that the film grain in skin and Marine is as much a character as like the house um the noise of it the static covers the entire film <laughs> i don't know if it ever goes away maybe it does um but from the first frame to the last you are seeing you are hearing this dense static that everything runs under or over and you have to see this like seven layers of after effects film grain that they laid on top of the screen in everything it's so thick and it's like this kaleidoscope kind of look at least up on the screen for us like where it just kind of turns in on itself uh and you constantly have this like illusion of very small motion through the film grain while on screen nothing is moving and that means when you're looking into the darkness down a hallway it's like you can almost see stuff down there and your brain fills it in <laughs> with what you think might mm. be uh in the darkness um and they do that for a hundred minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, part part of what was so effective is that there's just so much tension throughout the entire movie. I mean, it's like 20 minutes before something really significant happens, but there's all this just like staring into the dark and moving around the house. You kind of have you're oriented a little bit. There's like a downstairs where there's t this TV on playing old uh cartoon reruns there's the stairs that has this weird wood paneling and then there's the bedrooms upstairs and so you're moving kind of between these three uh places but it just it just gets in your head of like is there something there and there, is there something there and it's the thing is it stayed with me after the movie like i got home immediately had to turn on all the lights immediately had to like i was like is the skin of Marink in my house is he in my apartment right. um, and it, into the next day it was just like you know, I, I was getting creeped out in my own place. And like, it's been a long time since the movie did that. Yeah. Uh, Skin Marink is uh, effective, especially for those of us at home uh, in the United States, because it's filmed at like a standard Midwestern, 
like you know mid-colonial 90s home uh it's it's not particularly special in fact the director kyle Edward ball shot it in his parents house uh, the house he grew up in so i'm sure he's able to tug on a lot of these old memories from back in the day but uh when you go home to like any home in america usually your your interior architecture looks functionally the same <laughs> so when you turn off the lights in your house and you look up at the corners of the walls and down hallways like you're seeing skin of rink the only thing you're missing is the film grain um but boy uh it, it really does have this kind of haunting effect because not only does it spook you out of the dark but like the very scenes you're see you're, you're you're seeing or not seeing this strange thing in is your house <laughs> it looks like the room you sleep in yeah it looks like the hallways <laughs> you walk through like and you can't get away from it and it's funny like watching this in a theater and then driving home because it doesn't hit you till you get home and you open your door <laughs> and you start looking around and see the same colors of paint you know and the same popcorn ceilings that they've got in this house uh and suddenly like you're you're, you're right back there you know that now i should say uh this does this deep and dense horror uh, comes at a cost, and that cost is a very, very, very slow, agonizingly slow first half. So slow, uh, we've heard uh, here on our script and, and on Twitter, actually. I was reading this just last night. Um, there are people who, who are walking out who can't, who can't do it. It's so damn boring. And I, I too, also had this problem. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I had some friends who went and saw it, and they didn't make it halfway through. They kept nodding off. Right, friends of the show. Friends which, of the show. Like, yeah, people who go see big, bold which, cinema. Which, admittedly, I dozed off a little bit in the first 30 minutes because I was just a little bit too comfortable. My heat was my seat was heated. Oh, I seat was feeling, nice. feeling a little nappish, and uh, you dozed off a little bit myself. But, uh, yeah, it's, some people... It, it's definitely incredibly slow, like memorial level slow. We've talked about that movie before. Um, it's a very and but you got to know what you're getting into. It it's very experimental. Like it's going to be incredibly slow. Things are going to move at a snail's pace. They're going to get you into this mood, and um, it could definitely be cut down. It could maybe work better as an 80, 90 minute feature, but it, it's worth sticking with. Like if you can, that's why I, I'm really you know sad that my my friends left at the half like before the halfway point because i was like if you had made it to the halfway point and Man. finished it out because like the second yes. the back half of that movie is really where it's at um but it's incredibly slow and it's very i mean it's like what you would watch in film school or like as a musician it's like we would learn about kind of avant-garde new music uh creation like it's in that vein of experimentalism of being new and avant-garde and that's generally not what you go to the theater to see or see in the theater or see at this length but it, it's one of those things if you can you can kind of grind through the the slower <laughs> slower bits um i think it's really worth the payoff yeah um skin and rink I, I i feel like for for those who may not know, know, know nothing about it and have listened to our review up to this point for all of our praise in the first chunk of this it seems like well how, what do you mean people are walking out is it too scary? Is it, is it, what's wrong with it? It's, it's too boring. It is agonizingly boring. It's too, <laughs> like no, it's, it's too slow paced. That's what yes. I mean. Like it, it is. I mean, there, there, I mean, I, I also think I dozed off at one point, probably fully like for a minute or two and then woke back up in the theater. Um, I mean, I was getting sleepy eyes. I got that I got cozy seat. It's the end of the day. And you'd think like, how do you get, how do you, how do you get lulled to sleep by a movie that's, so scary how how do you get you know how, how does this happen and and this is something i've been pondering since i saw this movie like why wouldn't you cut that down like it doesn't need to be a hundred minutes it's an ifc midnight label film even like this could this could be 70 minutes and still technically run in 600 theaters you don't have to hit any kind of limit why is it so long why is it 30 minutes longer than it needs to be and i keep wondering if it's intentional if the idea is to disarm you, right? Like these kids in this house at night, the idea is that, okay, things aren't so bad and the TV's on. You can just start to kind of drift off. But then things start to happen. Like, and as you start to kind of rouse in your seat, like suddenly things aren't right and things start going wrong. Uh, a window's not where it used to be. A door's where it not, where it, not where it used to be. And you strain so much to see not only like what's not there, but even what is. I mean, you never even get a good look at the kids in this movie. You never see mom and dad's face. If anything, they're like... Uh, 
they're like the parents and peanuts, right? Like you just see <laughs> like the knees down. Sometimes you'll just see like a, a you know, a, a corner of a kid's head or like, you know, a hand like on the bed or something like you really don't get anything and your brain's got to work in overtime to put it all together. And by the time you get to the end of skin and Marink, like I, if you aren't rattled, man, I like you're, you're, you're made out of stone because <laughs> like, it, it, it oh really does. God. Like yeah. it lulls you into this feeling of like, it's not, this isn't that bad. I'm okay. And you're even bored by the time it turns up the heat and like, man, it, I, 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 I can't, I don't know. It's well, either see, bad of, editing or it's by design. Part of it is um, it's not just that it's long and that it's slow. It's also uh, not how you would, it, it's not like a normal narrative film would be where you introduce your characters, your a plot, B plot conflict, vil, antagonist, villain work through. Like it doesn't really have any of that because it's all about the feeling of, a nightmare, a feeling of waking up in the middle of the night and feeling like, like you're in a, alone. And so, like Zach was saying, we don't get, really get into, we don't get introduced to our characters. We just know them as mom, dad, uh, daughter, son. Like we said, we, we don't ever see, we don't see anyone's face. We just see, you know, we see people's legs most of the time, a lot of feet. We see, you know, you see the, you see the, the world from the children's perspective. You, it's very low with the camera pointed up, up like them looking up at the ceiling, up at the uh, things, and as you're seeing kind of spooky supernatural things. But that's also part of why it's a challenging watch because it's not, you're not getting all these kind of normal narrative films. Like I said, it's very experimental. It's very experiential. It's about the feeling of, of having a nightmare. It's a nightmare come to life. Reminds me of something like uh, Mulholland Drive, which is a dream come to life. Yes. And, and much like Mulholland or any dream or nightmare worth it's all like, I, it does feel front loaded with a lot of just kind of junk, but I think if you can get through to it to the end, like there's something really special happening in this movie. And I think if you're, if you're, if you're man, if you, if you claim to be a real horror fan, uh, if you like loved hereditary and ate midsummer up and can't wait to see the new Ari Aster picture, if you're like, man, you like, give me, give me, give me, I want more listen you need to go take swing at this movie because this this is something entirely different and it's exciting it's exciting that a movie like this is in theaters and, and i want to talk about really quick um how it got there i know i kind of front loaded the review with that story of um how it got ripped off from a festival and started getting passed around online but i i mean it's really is interesting like fundamentally this comes from a youtuber who doesn't even have a lot of subscribers by the way i went and looked he's got like seven thousand subscribers on his very small channel and he's got a 30 minute short on his channel that he made about a year ago called heck and heck is actually like the concept for skin and it's much tighter uh it's i don't think it's as chilling i haven't actually watched it um, but I probably need to go back and revisit it. I think it's actually even got a little bit more story than Skinner Inc. has. Uh, Skinner Inc. keeps things relatively abstract and leads your mind to wander, which I think is on point. But I think it's interesting. Um, this movie is in theaters because it got pirated so much. <laughs> I think it. I think it's interesting that in small circles, this movie went so viral, Shutter picked it up. And like now it's something we're talking about on this show. And it's weird, right? When something gets lifted by the internet and taken for a ride at the low, low cost of free. Um, and somehow it has also simultaneously been fantastic marketing. Um, Andy, do, do, I don't know. Do you think this movie plays best in a theater? Is it, is it best to watch it at home? Like I mean, after can... you rip it off the internet? I, I mean, either way, I think is go ahead. I think it could work either way. It, for me, it definitely worked in in the theater, and I think in some ways better because you're gonna have like the house. You will feel like the four year old because the house is gonna be as big as the the house a house is to a four year old by seeing it on the big screen. Also, also the sound design is a big part of it because it's it's the crackling of the of the static. It, it's the the thump that you hear upstairs overhead. It's the sound design is a big part of it, so it definitely works in the theater. At the same time watching it at home alone by yourself i th would actually kind of be terrifying i think but it, but you would have to commit to it like that means like no stopping it no getting on your phone like no like really dedicating yourself to to 100 minutes of this 
Yeah. And, and that's a challenge. I think a lot of people obviously aren't going to mount one, one for one. You're probably not going to go pirate skin a Marine, especially because it will very quickly be on shutter. It's in theaters now, but number two, do the attention span, I think of people is not going to withhold like the first half of this. Uh, we, I mean, even in our theater, like the girl sitting next to me got her phone out twice in the, in like that first, first half, second half, Dude, not once. She was clutching her pearls, hiding under the blanket she brought. <laughs> like it was, it was great sitting next to somebody who, who didn't. Know, I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into, but clearly she didn't either. Um, and I think that's what was so really so interesting about Skin and Rink is is it front loads its credits, and the movie ends, and the lights come up, and like nobody in our theater like just stood up, like, "Well, that's that," and like strolled out. Like every one of us was like shook to the core. <laughs> And everybody turns and starts talking to their friends like, oh, my God. Like, did you see that? It was, <laughs> that was of, crazy. It was one of like, those it, those bits where I, I was, like, angry because I had gotten so scared. Man. <laughs> and I was yeah, mad that I, the film had let had made me get that scared. Yes. Um, you know, I, I wonder what other horror, you know, creatives in the space are thinking about this movie. I'll bet Jason Bloom is, like itching to talk to Kyle Edward Ball. <laughs> I, bet, I bet Bloomhouse, who's currently sporting Megan, is looking at Skinnamarink making seven hundred thousand dollars in six in six hundred theaters, and they're like, "Oh my God, we got to get a piece of whatever's happening here." Like, it's truly something special. It's it's genuinely something different, and that's for better or worse. Like, I, I man, I think you either like what it's doing or you don't. But we should probably get to recommendations. I think uh, Andy, any other thoughts before we jump to recommendations? Well, only that uh, a, f- a follow up to this film or whatever he does next um, would need to be, you know, more commercial, more tr- like it's some sort of traditional narrative with characters. Like y- if you could capture the mood and, and the scares and the chillingness of this film and put it into something more commercial, like you would ha- you would have something. I know. Like if you if you ran this like in October, oh my god, people would be so spooked like walking out of the theater in, during spook season. Like, I think there's there's really something special here. Um, and with that, we should get to it. Andy, would you recommend Skin Marink? I would recommend it to fans of horror, uh, hardcore fans of horror, and to those who seek out bold cinema. Uh, like I said, it's it's very long. Or it's not very long. It's a hundred minutes, and it's incredibly slow, and it's very like you have to really be with it. You got to pay attention. It's experimental. It's experiential. Uh, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. It's not going to be uh, for everyone, but I think if if you know what you're getting into and you know what kind of film it is, I think you'll have a much better time. Like if you would have walked in blind and you don't, you just think you're going to see a regular horror movie, definitely kind of be be angry you went to see it but i i think people who who are looking for something things that are new and different um i i think it, it would behoove you to uh to find a screening and get through it yeah i'm in the same boat i think skin rings great um i think yeah if you're a horror fan you should go see it the the biggest warning in the front my god you are going to be bored you you got to put your phone away all right have some have some guts put it on the line and give it give it your attention like i don't think you'll be disappointed like it's 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 a bit of an experience a lot of people said memoria was like uh more like an art gallery like going to like a showing than like a movie and like in its in its own weird way i think skin and Marink might also kind of fall into that category but like give it a go because what's happening in here i think is really special and i i if you have the means i'd say try to go see it in a theater just get swallowed by the screen mm-hmm. like just really <laughs> Like, don't, like, I don't put yourself in a position where you can get your phone out. Yeah, I, like, I know. I, I think I might try to go see it again. Like knowing knowing what it is now and how it ends, I think there's definitely a lot of that I missed in the beginning part, which I said is kind of difficult to get through. Um, but now I, I definitely want to try and catch another screening. I know. I don't. I I do think I'll be significantly more bored round two though. That's the thing. I do wonder if this, it's a bit of a one trick pony, right? Is it going to be as be. fun the second time? But at the same time, like you, I guarantee round two, you still will not be able to predict where a lot of the events are going to happen. Like, cause it's just a lot of long segments of like, not a lot happening. And that's what disarms you. Like before you know it, you're right back in it. Um, but yeah, I think I might want to go see it again as well. Uh, with that, we should move on. It's been way too long talking about Skin and Brink, but it's something special. Uh, we need to talk about the Golden Globes. 
That's right. Uh, yes. So the Golden Globes happened. Uh, we don't normally cover them a lot on this show, but sometimes they can be a bit of an indicator as to where the Oscars might be going, right? They're relatively popular. Uh, and I, I think it's worth kind of talking about what's going on. So, Andy, what happened to the Golden Globes this year? Well, one thing before we get into it, I wanted to mention that the Golden Globes had become kind of this black sheep of the award show a couple of years ago. There were all these uh, kind of allegations of of corruption. There, there were uh, people taking bribes, uh, of like people getting like fancy hotels or like that kind of stuff to sway votes, and uh, they weren't supported for a while, and they weren't even like they had, they couldn't find anywhere to air. Um, and I think they actually aired somewhere online <laughs> this time as as well. But um, so, but they have managed to turn that around. They have diversified kind of their their voting uh, group voting block uh and the golden globes have gotten a little bit more respect than they had even a few years ago and that that's important to just remember in the background moving on to the awards we have a uh, best motion picture drama the winner was the fablemans which i can't roll my eyes any harder at uh also well <laughs> yeah. also nominated was avatar the way of water elvis tar and top gun uh mavericks Eck, what do you think about this okay first off we haven't seen the fablemans for all your eye rolling you don't actually know it might be amazing but we're pretty skeptical here on off script uh look we love spielberg just fine but yeah, there's been a lot of good stuff that came out this year uh of the five i'm a little surprised it didn't just go to top gun um because i mean everybody liked top gun right Right. Th that's what i'm having a, a hard time with and i do need to see this but like i just don't see a, f a family drama really winning over big things like elvis or avatar even which i'm not a fan of avatar but at least it's a big event of you know a director with a grand vision and it's really like something new in cinema so i think with, with top gun but here we are uh moving on to uh best performance by an actress went to kate blanchett for tar which we're going to be talking about uh briefly and uh, other nominees were olivia coleman for empire of Light, viola davis for the woman king Anna de Armas for Blonde. Nice to see her on there. Uh, Michelle Will Williams for The Fablemans. So of that list, Zach. Listen, um, I first off was surprised that uh, Michelle Yeoh wasn't on that list for Everything Everywhere because she's tremendous in it. And I think she's being shortlisted for the Oscars alongside, of course, she's, many of these nominees. She's on the musical or comedy oh that's right she's in me oh okay yeah she is okay well then disregard that of the five we have here do Kate blanchett's really good in tar we're gonna talk about tar in just a minute let's talk about the golden globes and what this might mean but uh do Kate blanchett's really good in tar <laughs> she is really <laughs> solid really really good uh best performance by an actor uh for drama winner went to I almost said Elvis. Winner went to Austin Butler Almost. for yeah. Elvis. Uh, other nominees were Brendan Fraser for the, the Whale, Hugh Jackman, The Sun, Bill Nye for Living, and Jeremy Pope, uh, The Inspection. But not surprised at all uh, for Austin Butler. As far as Oscars goes, though, uh, a lot of times something like the Oscar is a culminate. It's a culminating award, so Austin Butler will probably need to get a few more features under his belt before he, he wins the big one, but nice to see him, him win here. Yeah. Uh, notably Brendan Fraser run won uh, just the other night at the critics choice awards uh, for the whale as best performance in an actor. Uh, he had a really, really great tearful acceptance speech. Uh, it's worth mentioning. He did. He does not attend the golden globes because of uh, some previous happenings with the Hollywood foreign press uh, who puts it on. You can read about Brendan Fraser in that, uh, go off um but uh i the only other one i think might have had a chance here was bill nye for living we haven't seen it but i've heard nothing but incredible things yeah about i've heard really good things movie. about that so I, we did see a trailer once probably should watch that at some point other than that you're kind of right austin butler's got a whole career to, to, to earn an oscar all right elvis is real good but i don't know if he'll take the crown uh with that we should jump into best motion picture musical or comedy actually a stacked category after this i'm probably not going to bother to read uh other uh other nominees unless it's notable winner was the banshees of inishirin uh going up against everything everywhere all at once glass onion babylon and triangle of sadness and some of you might write off babylon and a lot of you didn't see triangle of sadness but everything everywhere is a really really big one to topple it's a tremendous feature i think it's shortlisted for best picture at the oscars andy what do you think I'm surprised. Band I mean, I, I like the Banshees of Inisherin, but 
and it, it is it is great filmmaking and really kind of profound movie but i i would just think something more creative like babylon or everything everywhere would, would have won yeah uh i'm in the same boat best performance by an actress in motion picture musical comedy goes to michelle yo and everything ever all at once there we go finally presentation yeah. yes uh and and surprising to me a little i think the other two that were worth mentioning are margot robbie and babylon on taylor joy and the menu uh both solid neither of them i think beat michelle yo like gosh she's so good in that movie mm-hmm uh, best performance by an actor in a motion picture music hall or comedy goes to Colin Farrell, Banshees of Inisherin. And my man is shortlisted to win everything this year. God, everybody loves him in that movie. He's got the biggest, bushiest, saddest eyebrows, and he loves his donkey. I mean, what's <laughs> not to love? Like he does, he does great in that movie. Uh, only other one I think might have had a real swing in it was Daniel Craig and Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery, or uh, Ralph Fine, Ray Fine's in the menu, who's really good. Ray right, Fine's I, really good in the menu. I, I've heard that Colin Farrell and uh, Brendan Fraser are basically the con- main contenders for this award in, for, in the Oscars. Yeah, and I think that's probably going to hold up come uh, next Tuesday when we find out who the noms are. What's next? Uh, best motion picture animated went to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio, which I flipped out about because I thought it was Disney's Pinocchio that had won it, and I was like, oh, going to throw a table. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you texted me about it, and I was like, that's a good thing. You like that movie. Yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, so really excited about that. Definitely uh, deserves it. Yes. Uh, uh, not- notably, uh, two stop motion movies this year and nominated Game of Thrones, Pinocchio, and Marcel Zell, she's on. So, hey, shout out to my stop motion fans. Best motion picture, non English language, uh, which is formerly foreign film, which they've kind of phased out that phrase. All Quiet on the Western Front from Germany was nominated. The winner, Argentina, 1985 from Argentina. We have not. I've not heard of this film before. I've not seen it, um, but it, it's beat. I mean, it beat all the things we do know. Decision to leave, RRR, All Quiet on the Rest of from Front. So it it's, must be something special. Listen, Decision to Leave is stellar, and All Quiet on the Western Front is a stunning feature. And I haven't watched it, but I hear RRR, which is on Netflix, might be one of the best films like of all time. We really need to sit down and give it a go at some point. I have never heard of Argentina 1985. That movie must be like the, the eyes of God. It must be one of the most special films ever. I, I like. I don't know. I, I got to see what that movie's about. Um. Best performance by uh, supporting actress went to Angela Bassett for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. There, there's talk that she could win the, the Oscar. Uh, you know, in a couple of months, we'll see how the nominations. Um, other, other, no, other notables are Jamie Lee Curtis for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, and Carrie Condon for The Banshees of Inish Sharon. Listen, I, I wish all of them could be winners in my heart, but man, Bassett's so good in Black Panther. She totally holds up like an emotional pillar in that film that I don't know that few others I think could could bring to the table. Like she's tremendous. Uh, best performance by an actor in supporting role goes to Kay Kwan. Uh, everything ever all at once. Hey man, my man short round finally getting some recognition. Thank God. Good for him. I, another one just like Fraser. Emotional speech. Everybody loves it. It feels like he's getting his. It, it's his turn. Like look, Hollywood loves that stuff. All right, like fantastic for him. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but <laughs> no, other, other, than, <laughs> other than other than then there were two nominees from the Banshees of Venice here and Brendan Gleeson and Barry uh, Keegan. Moving on to best picture, best director, the big one uh, went to Steven Spielberg for the Fablemans. Every, all the other big directors, James Cameron, uh, the Dan, the Daniels, Bosorman, Martin McDonough also nominated. Uh, not surprising. Well, actually, I'm kind of surprised. I feel like he's winning because he's the name. Like anyone else comes out with that movie, and like you're not going to be that that interested again. I, we need to watch it, but who Spielberg? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, listen, like I know we need to watch the Fablemans, all right. And I look, I'm not saying Spielberg's not incredibly talented. He obviously is, but like, I don't know. Yeah, like we're look, we're just not that confident. We're people that go watch movies, and we feel like it's probably fine. Like it probably, I don't know. Maybe, maybe look, maybe it's great maybe it's great um but i really i really hope daniel's had it for everything everywhere this year uh best screenplay uh went to the banshees of minas sharon uh from martin mcdonough no surprise there really great great writing uh tar everything everywhere women talking and the fablemans were the other nominees (laughs) 
Um, this one actually surprises me a little. Like, I like Banshees a ton. Like, and Martin McDonough has put in some great work. I'm surprised but that Babylon isn't on there. I'm a little surprised Babylon's not on there. Everything Everywhere is a really special sort of script about generational trauma, living with ADHD. <laughs> it's got a lot going on in it. Uh, and and again, we're about to talk about Tar. The Tar script is like razor sharp, man. It's real good. Like it's so dense, and it's written by somebody who like clearly is steeped in the musical world. Like Tar's really special. So Banshees is great. Um, but it's 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 I think it's beautiful in its minimalism, and that's why it's so appreciated here. Uh, best original score. I'm really excited to talk about this one. Babylon, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Justin Hurwitz takes one. Uh, and, uh, other other exciting uh, nominees included Hilda uh, Good Goodna 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 for Women Talking. I don't actually Goodna Daughter. Goodna Daughter. That's it. Uh, Women Talking. Uh, Carter Burwell from Banshees of Inisherin and John Williams for the Fablemans. Listen, love John Williams. All right, he's great. Banshees has a great soundtrack. Haven't seen Women Talking. Dude, ba- the Babylon soundtrack goes so hard. Like, if it, for anybody who's it's like Babylon jam. sucked, you cannot tell me the Babylon soundtrack is bad. It isn't. Like, it's so great. And uh, moving on to our, our last category, best original song went to "Not to Not to" from RRR, which was apparently a huge upset because it beat things like Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, and Rihanna, who all had huge songs in major. Uh, films taylor swift for uh, a song called carolina from where the crawdads sing lady gaga from top gun maverick rihanna from wakanda forever so really incredible that this other song from rrr won yeah a little me too uh you know i i couldn't i couldn't hum the top gun maverick song from lady gaga i at least remember the rihanna track pretty well um but again man i I hear rr is something really special we'll watch it it's it's got to happen for the podcast at some point it's on netflix we get we get no excuse um and any hot takes towards the oscars what do you think is this pretty accurate um i I think well well, i mean there's always things that get snubbed there's always things there's surprises uh so some things will will not be surprised there'll there'll be films we haven't talked about or really thought about that'll be on the oscars and then things that you know, should be on there that that aren't. Um, it'll be interesting to see, like the best pictures, because they can choose as many as ten. It's usually eight or nine, so it'll be what interesting what ends up on that list. Who who they pick for these the directors, that sort of thing. So those get announced Tuesday morning, early, like seven a.m. because they happen at five a.m. on the West Coast, super early. So they hit all the media stuff by like nine. Uh, but we'll we'll be on ready to talk about that uh, at the end of next week. It's been a really tremendous year at the movies. Uh, 2022 had a lot going on. It seems like 2023 is going to be even more exciting. If you want to check out our top 10 list, you can go back and listen to our previous episode. I think 200 was when we did our top 10 of 2022. Had a lot of winners on there. And definitely some that aren't mentioned here at all, like Sam Mendez's Empire of Light or uh, Luca Guadagnino's Bones and All or Paramount Pictures' Jackass Forever. So I guess... It's been a good time at the movies, and I'm hoping that the Oscars uh, coming out next week with the Oscar noms will reflect that. Uh, with that, we should move into our final film of the episode. We are running long, so we're going to see if we can keep this one tight, but I'm really excited to talk about it. Andy, please take it away. Tar. So this is the latest film from director Todd Field, who hasn't made a movie in like 16 years. His last film was Little Children from 2000 six or seven uh great film starring kate winslet uh really really like that movie definitely check it out this movie is about a woman named lydia tar who is a world famous uh professional conductor of symphony orchestras uh we first meet her doing this kind of npr style interview where there's basically bringing up all her accolades you know she is uh studied at, at juilliard she got her phd in vienna she's conducted all the major five orchestras in the united states she's conducted she's currently the, like the the principal conductor of the berlin philharmonic one of the best orchestras in in the world she is an egot winner meaning she's won an emmy grammy oscar and tony she's god's gift to music and conducting and she she is working on this uh, recording of all of Mahler's uh, nine symphonies, and sh- they they are working on the last one, the the famous fifth symphony, probably Mahler's mo- most famous. And uh, they will soon be starting 
rehearsals with the Berlin Philharmonic to do this epic uh, recording with Dorcha Gramophone. And that's kind of how we meet her. She's this, this star of the classical music world, incredible, like fond over genius. Um, but she's kind of a terrible person. <laughs> and uh, she, she is um, like, even though she's a, a musical in, incredibly musically, uh, she's very manipulative. She's very narcissistic. She uses her position of power. Uh, she abuses her position of power. To, she manipulates other people. She, uh, you know, she is, for lack of a better term, she's a womanizer. She's a uh, she's a lesbian. She has a partner with one of the violinists in in her orchestra. They they have uh, a daughter, but she still kind of has. She fools around on, on the side to the kind of to the knowledge of everyone. Um, and so we we have this very flawed character, which is part of the reason uh, Martin Scorsese was saying that this movie like is saving cinema. But I and I can see why he likes it because he likes flawed characters uh, as well. And at the beginning, we we after we meet her, she does a, cl a conducting class at Juilliard, um, and she's very she's very old school. She uh, kind of belittles the, this young conductor who just wants to conduct new music, and she's like, "Well, why don't you just c conduct some Bach?" you know, get into to the roots. And he's like, well, I, he's kind of a problematic figure. He sired 20 odd children. He's not, I'm not, as a person of color, I'm not interested in his music. And and she kind of does not jive with, with this whole thing. She's like, you don't know what you're talking about. You're never going to be a conductor if you've never conducted Bach. And uh, this is the kind of, of person uh, she she is. And this is, Kind of, this is our setup. I'm not going to talk too much longer, but that's who we get. We we get this brilliant conductor who's also a very flawed uh, person and whose decisions kind of create some self destruction. Zach, what do you think? Uh, Andy and I watched this movie together uh, at his place. It's available on video on demand uh, for five ninety nine. Um, and let me tell you, uh, I do not have much of a musical background. And Dr. Draper on the other end of the mic is an esteemed uh, musical fellow who has done a lot, played a lot of instruments. My man knows his music. Watching this movie next to a music major is a bit of a blessing and a curse because Andy was able to fill in a lot of gaps that I didn't understand. Um, but at the same time, uh, Lydia Tarr is hoisted on the shoulders of absolute giants in the opening of this film uh the after after a brief introduction with a a, a bunch of opening credits uh, featuring a lot of the music in the film and the artists who brought it together uh lydia tar is explained to be like one of the greatest of all time she's got and she's got an egot right which is a emmy grammy oscar tony like alongside 15 others of the most talented people in the world she's worked with the greatest composer studied under Leonard Bernstein. Like this movie goes out of its way to put her next to the names of like the most creative, talented people ever to walk the earth. And then <laughs> systematically over two hours and 37 minutes just boils her down in a character study that is like really fascinating of a woman who fundamentally uh abuses her position like in one way or another and it's kind of kind of amazing it does it through an agonizingly uh slow presentation of a life full of spinning plates lydia tar is juggling a person over in this country and and then she's got her family back home and then she's got the the, the big thing coming up in Berlin and she's, she's practicing on her piano and she's bouncing between houses and residences and, and residencies and auditions like to create like quite the maze of a life. And over the course of the film, we get to know her in like a shockingly intimate way as a person who is very flawed and is supremely human uh, in, in, in a way that she is not presented at the open. And I think it's, kind of stellar god Kate blanchett does such a fantastic job as lydia tar i mean she she has incredible monologues usually multiple minutes at a time without cuts uh there's a fantastic 10 minute sequence in the first act and andy had mentioned it um where she delivers i mean 
not only instruction but critique and ultimately dashes another artist's like ambitions in one scene she walks up and down stairs backwards she she <laughs> waves her arms like a conductor conducting an orchestra and that's only when she's instructing she manages to lead like composers and and, and st instruct other musicians and present is like such a stellar individual um and it, it, I don't know if this movie would work without her at the, at the center of it. She is the ooey gooey center of Lydia Tarr. Right. Like you said, she, she has all those things of a person in, in power. Um, and the thing about classical music, it's, it's very small. It's not like my, I, my kind of analogy to film would be like, if you were taking a class and Steven Spielberg came in and talked to your class, like that doesn't really happen in film because those directors are so big, but in classical music, it's more likely for something like that to happen. But she's so, she's so powerful that she's such a kingmaker that everyone is kind of afraid of her and everyone wants to just do her bidding because they, you know, she can make her and break careers. And we kind of see the problem about that. And what I, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's some issues with this movie, but I think what I, I love what it's about. And it's I, I think that that age old question of like, can you separate the the art from the, the artist? And the older people are, the, the more for willingness, we, the more willing we are to do that. But I think Todd F Field is really presenting that question is like, well, what happens if you don't or what happens if you experience those those terrible things from brilliant minds kind of a, in the present? uh tar is a bit of a musical character study uh it reminded me in it's open of like whiplash right damien chazelle uh, a student who is uh struggling to take instruction from a very harsh uh instructor but that is like only a small slice of lydia tar in fact uh, she's got multiple kind of pieces of baggage uh she's got a family and a young daughter uh and i uh, believe a wife I, I think they're actually properly married uh, she's got uh, an orchestra who she's trying to manage effective relationships with. She's got an assistant composer or assistant conductor who she wants to get rid of. But as Andy tells me, like that doesn't, that doesn't really work that way at that level. Um, she's got the, the biggest audience in the world, uh, at the biggest, uh, symphony hall in the world in berlin like a, a super special place she's got a, a mentor she looks up to she's got a board of directors to please lydia tar is like a, a very high functioning society and she's in all parts genius like her her ability to i don't know i don't know how to express it musically craft a symphony that like is unheard of from other conductors and and and, and present music and i mean i don't know help me fill in the blanks what, here andy why is right. she why well, is her talent so special as a conductor well we're never really told that we, we just she just is she just is a star you know it, it's it we don't really get into the weeds of why her conducting is so great or why why she's such a revered person and it doesn't really matter i mean she, this could honestly take place in any it could take place in sports or in entertainment or in different things the the point is that she is a star in this world and she wields a lot of power and she abuses a lot of power we we're talking about relationships like she we see her kind of flirting with someone at, at uh after this this class that she teaches and it's clear that they're probably going to get to know each other famously later on there is the kind of result of some sort of destructive relationship that is creeping in the background that is getting closer and closer we see her also eyeing a new a new cellist joins the orchestra and she kind of begins manipulating situations to be around this this cellist and again it, it's a huge power imbalance because this is like a young girl new to the orchestra she's not even full full time time yet there or isn't a full member meanwhile you have the conductor who can make or break your career showing some interest and so you see she just has this tendency to just kind of take what she wants and, and not care about the circumstances or or the consequences rather um but i wanted to touch on one thing that really stood out to me is that uh lydia tar is kind of a dinosaur in some ways you see her really out of touch, particularly in that opening scene with the uh, with this where her and the student kind of get into it because he's like, well, I'm a BIPOC pan gender this. I don't relate to a white guy, an old white guy like Bach. And she just really blows that off. And but there's other things like she, she doesn't she's kind of taken aback when her this new young cellist that she she likes 
uh well i watched you know people on youtube that's how i got into it and she's like appalled that oh you, you mean you weren't l- listening to this person on a record and there's she is slowly or probably more than she realizes kind of out of touch with reality kind of out of touch with culture and that's part of why she is so terrible yeah tar like her un, un unraveling over the course of the movie is particularly effective um because the movie really respects its audience um it's not going to hit you over the head and be like look at what lydia tar did that's wrong like it'll usually just kind of like if she's looking at a text message we'll just cut to the text message briefly with the text on screen for you know five seconds and then cut back to her reaction and the scene moves on like it, it's a movie that asks you to sit down and really ponder like the people you're looking at and the situations you're seeing and often that leads to a, a level of an, an air of perception that i think is kind of baked into lydia tar's very identity how people perceive her is obviously very important to her i mean she she as the conductor she sees herself as uh, the navigator of time this is actually explained really well in an opening monologue uh time moves with lydia tar time stops with lydia tar everybody moves at her pace uh when she wants her orchestra's attention she says all eyes on me eyes up here everybody everybody look at me i i'm i'm the star everything surrounds me the orchestra surrounds me And she sees herself as this hoisted up on this podium in this moment as this great thing. And what's really fascinating is to watch Lydia Tarr's life (laughs) become something that, or really like uh, to see it blossom into something that is not all that fantastic and, and to see her like juggling these problems that she creates for herself creates a very stellar symphony of wrongdoings that, lead to i think a very satisfying conclusion as we were watching the movie at one point i got up to go to the bathroom it's on vod and he paused it and he said when is this going to go wrong <laughs> when is this going to turn when is this going to take take this what is this situation going to reach some kind of climactic something and we begin to see the fallout uh, and it very satisfyingly like brings us into a place I think that will appease viewers or at least most it's definitely received some crit- criticism uh, uh, namely from I can't recall her name I'm looking at IMDb trivia now and I can't find it but a composer who somebody said the film may be loosely based on another female uh, female conductor I'm sorry uh, who has said that she very much disagrees with the presentation in here and that she disagrees with the way conductors are perceived and, and she's offended as a lesbian she's offended as a woman and I think that's all like worth looking at it that's important right. discourse to have that's why i wanted to bring it up on the show that reminds me uh she is a lesbian in the, in the film but she's also very kind of masculine presenting and not just in her appearance like she wears these pantsuits but just kind of in her attitude and i think that's something you uh, in to take away because she's asked you know have you been the victim of sexual harassment or you know uh discrimination and she's like no not not at all i you know like i i've you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants if, and it's kind of an exercise in privilege. It's like you're you're kind of denying that that exists just because it hasn't happened uh, to you. And she kind of she behaves very much like men in this power imbalance structure have acted. And uh, as someone who was in the world of classical music for a long time, this that's very real. And that's a huge problem um, because, again, it, it's people in power around people who are trying to have careers in a feel it's very difficult to get into and there's huge power imbalances and people often just feel you know pressured to do things they normally wouldn't because of of their their career so that's kind of a study uh in that i do think the movie might be a little long two hours 37 minutes and absolutely it 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 does tend to drag Uh, what you get though in that exchange is a specific attention to detail and nuance um it reminded me in pacing a little of that like that movie um movie a video game uh reminds me of a video game uh red dead redemption 2 a a video game where things can move agonizingly slow because the the game developer rockstar uh wanted you to feel like things were happening in real time and feel the impact of things so when you go to get on your horse your cowboy and it just takes like a minute to get up on the horse the cowboy's got to swing his leg up and get over and shift his weight and the horse has got to back up and then you can get going And Tar, I think, takes a lot of those same cues in in spirit anyway. Uh, It is a movie that moves slow, but at the expense of, like, I think an emotional plot that rings pretty sharp 
for what it is. I, I, you know, something is up with Lydia Tarr. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be a three hour movie about a fictional character named after her. If it wasn't about something and you know, it's there. And once you kind of get to the ooey gooey center, what that is, I think you come out with something really fascinating. I, I, Andy's right. Like Scorsese talking about, Oh my God, this is fantastic. A man who already loves character studies, I think says all it needs to about, how special this movie is and why I think it's a contender for Oscar season. Planchet is so God, she's so good in this movie. I can't mm-hmm. get over it. I mean, it's probably one of her best performances. Yeah. It, it's fantastic performance for her for playing this kind of terrible narcissistic uh, abuser, uh, essentially. And, but also for someone who is overextending their power and overestimating how much power they do act, actually have. It is definitely too long. It could cut 20, 30 minutes for sure. With that, I'm not sure I have much more to say about it. Andy, any other thoughts for recommendations? Uh, thoughts on the music? Mahler, Beethoven? I don't. I, don't it, really, I mean, it really just it, use, it makes great use of Mahler's Fifth, Fifth Symphony. It's a lot. The music pops up a lot in this. Mm, all right. Well, they, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, Andy, would you recommend Tar? Uh, I would say save it for for streaming. Like like we watched it. Like I said, it's very very long, and it does get in in the weeds. It with like classical music. I knew a lot of what they were talking about because I that's what I studied in college. But it could be a little bit hard to follow. Her performance is great, and I love the themes of this movie. It's just a little bit too long. <laughs> I think I'm in the same boat. It's good stuff. It's definitely drawn as an epic, but it may not be quite as epic as Lydia Tarr believes she is. That being said, like I still think it's very good at what it does. I think it's a razor sharp script script from somebody who's been steeped in the music world. Hey, it's crazy to read Todd Field, who wrote and directed it. He hasn't done a movie since 2006. And apparently, he wrote this script in like 12 weeks and wrote it only for Blanchett. Hey, apparently, it wasn't going to do it for Blanchett. Hey, it, it was a whole thing. There's a story about him crashing his car while he was on the phone with her agent. But either way, I, I think I'm glad Tar exists. I'm glad a movie like this can get in theaters. I do think it's something really stellar and sets a bar for what's possible yeah. in the character study space. And with that, I think it about wraps our show for the week. Andy, what are we watching next week? So we're, we're trying to figure out what we're going to watch. Uh, there's a couple of new releases. Uh, the Sun starring Hugh Jackman and Missing starring Storm Reid. Uh, these are coming out. We're not going to be watching them. We're not. We don't have a whole lot of interest. The big thing is the Oscar nominations are going to be announced next Tuesday. We're going to be talking about that, and we're going to see probably find something online to watch. Maybe something like The Fablemans or RRR or something like that. That's right. It's gonna be it's gonna be a surprise next week on Off Script Film Review. If you are interested in what we might be watching, if you liked our reviews today, if you want to know more about Skinnamarink, or if uh, Tar really is worth the price of admission, uh, feel free to follow us on social media. You can follow us on on podcast too, but that's by subscribing. I'll get to that in just a second. We live stream the show every face every Facebook every Tuesday on Facebook around five p.m. CST, and you can watch our full episodes there. Comment while we're doing the show. Engage with us here. Uh, we upload our our live streams to youtube we're on twitter we're on instagram and you can find us in all the usual podcast outlets itunes google play spotify iHeartMedia. the best way to follow us on those is to subscribe to the show you can subscribe on any podcast outlet that you're listening to us or watching us on subscribe to us on youtube follow us on facebook and uh you know keep up with your boys here at off script movies are expensive podcasts are cheap and off script is here for you you can check out our website offscriptfilmreview.com to see more reviews interviews andy has been doing all over the country it's bananas my man has been out hustling <laughs> that's and right it's working yeah i love it so if you came here from those uh hello thanks for listening and uh you can email us correspondence right into the show at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com Com. I think that about covers everything from all of us at Offscript, the home, Bold Cinema. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper.